Awesome. Thank you, Jason and Kevin. That was great. Okay, we're going to get started with our second presentation for the evening. Our speaker originally comes from New Jersey and did her undergraduate studies at Princeton School in New Jersey in physics. Uh, as a, a person from New Jersey, it's almost required that she be a Bruce Springsteen fan, and she is a Bruce Springsteen super fan, which will be re revealed in her, in her slides tonight. Uh, she joined as a PhD candidate at Caltech in the astronomy department. She is now a fourth year student here, and she is a, a world expert in tidal disruption events, that is to say stars getting torn apart by black holes when they pass a little bit too close to them. And she's going to talk about a really interesting topic that's a, a major open question in the field of astrophysics today, and that is, how do we form the most massive black holes in the universe? These supermassive black holes that we see evidence for and can even take pictures of with radio telescopes. Uh, so we're going to hear all about that tonight. So please welcome our speaker, Jean Sumowar. Thank you so much for the introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Let me know if you can. I might put the microphone too much. So thank you so much for coming. I'm so excited to be with you here tonight. Um, and I'm going to be talking about how do supermassive black holes form. This is the reason I am in astronomy, the subject. So I find it extremely exciting. I personally think it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest, questions we have to answer in astronomy today. But before I get into how they form, why don't we first talk about what they are? So let's take apart the the term supermassive black hole. And we'll just start with black hole, keep it simple-ish. So black hole is just a really, really massive but very compact object, it's very dense. Within this radius called the event horizon, so within a certain distance of the black hole, even if you're moving at the speed of light, you can't get away. So to make this a little more concrete, I'm gonna use you know, a perfect example. Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> so let's take you know, your average Joe and try to make him a black hole and see what we need to do to do that. So I sort of guessed at his size. So we're gonna approximate he's 180 pounds and roughly six feet tall. I think he's actually 5'9", but that's details. <laughs> so say you were trying to hug him or stand on his head or something and you wanted to escape his gravity. You'd only have to move at roughly 0.0001 miles per hour. And so you might know if you've ever tried to hug someone, you can in fact move away from them without going at the speed of light. Or if you try to throw a ball away from yourself, the ball does not come back. Light, on the other hand, moves at a billion miles per hour. So we want to have to make him dense enough that we need to move at a billion miles per hour to get away. So let's try shrinking him a little bit. Let's make him about the size of a pencil, roughly a centimeter. This is better. Now we're at 0.001 miles per hour to escape his gravitational pull. So not quite a billion. So let's go even further. Now we're going to make him the size of an atom, so roughly 0.1 nanometer, so 10 to the negative 10 meters tall still keeping the same weight, so he's just really, really dense now. We're getting to more respectable speeds, so if you wanted to hug him and then move away, you'd have to move at roughly 20 miles per hour, of course, still not a billion. So let's just go many, many orders of magnitude smaller. So now we're gonna make him 10 to the 10, so 10 billion times smaller than the size of an atomic nucleus, so just the inner part of an atom, which is already really, really small. Now we finally got a black hole. Even if you were moving at the speed of light, you could not stop hugging Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> to give a few other examples for the not massive Bruce Springsteen fans in the audience, you'd have to make the Earth roughly the size of a marble to make it a black hole, or the sun roughly the size of a small town a few miles in diameter. And when you make it that small, if you get within that size, you can't escape no matter what you do. Okay. So this is all nice and theoretical. We know what a black hole is. It's a really dense object. No matter how fast you move, you're not getting away. But do they actually exist? Do we see them? So they do. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking about them. We see them in astronomy all the time. And I think one of the most common types of black holes that you might have heard about are stellar mass black holes. So these are black holes roughly the size of the mass of our sun. These are formed when stars die. Not our sun exactly, but stars a little bit more massive, maybe 10 times more massive. When they explode in a supernova, what's left behind is a black hole. This is an example of a supernova people discovered, which is thought to host the youngest, possibly the youngest black hole in our galaxy. So the supernova went off roughly 1,000 years old. The different colors are different. 
wave bands, so um, there's radio, x-ray, and infrared in there. Roughly a thousand years ago it exploded, you're seeing the remnant of the supernova, and at the center might be a stellar mass black hole. So there are other ways we can find them other than maybe inside these giant booming supernova. So you might have seen Ed Nathan's Astro on Tap a few months ago where he talked about what happens if you take a stellar mass black hole and put it next to a star. It might start eating the star. So this is an artist rendition of you have a stellar mass black hole way in that center of the dot there, and it's eating material from a star. It's forming this hot disk of material that's slowly falling into the black hole. It's launching relativistic streams of material. It's a really extreme event, and we see these in our galaxy. And they're so energetic and so powerful, and you have something so compact at the center where we know they're stellar mass black holes. We can also see them because of their gravitational pulls. So there's, they have such strong gravity that if you put, say, a star behind a black hole, well behind it, it bends the light of the star around the black hole. We can see those distortions. So you can see how there's a black hole somewhere in the center here, and it's bent all the light coming around into this ring. And so we can detect this and use it to find evidence for stellar mass black holes. But, so these are nice, tiny black holes, very exciting. But what about the bigger ones? So let's move up and scale a few orders of magnitude to, say, roughly 10,000 to 10 billion times the size of our sun. So these black holes do exist, and they're called supermassive black holes. How do we know they exist? There's a couple different lines of evidence. So the first supermassive black holes that were discovered were found because of these objects called quasars. So quasars are these distant galaxies that have a booming source of light at the center. So if you look at them in the sky, they look like a star. Of course, not with your bare eyes, with a telescope. They look like a star. They're extremely luminous, but they're way farther away than any star in our galaxy. They can be way in the distant universe. So they're much brighter than a star if you were to actually be next to it. They're in fact so energetic that there's nothing we really know of that could have produced them. So when they were first discovered, I think in the 1960s, people thought they must be something like a black hole because only that can produce enough energy to produce gigantic beams of light. And this was eventually confirmed. Um, and now we know of many different quasars in the sky. But another way we know about black, supermassive black holes is our own galaxy. So in fact, most galaxies are thought to host a supermassive black hole. And we been able to directly image the one in our own galaxy because it's so nearby. So this black hole is called Sagittarius A star. It's roughly 26,000 light years away. And this is a sort of animated version of an image that was taken of this black hole fairly recently. You may have heard about the Event Horizon Telescope, which is sort of a coordinated effort with radio telescopes across the globe to take a picture of the black hole. So the black hole is somewhere at the center of this black circle, and you're seeing material around it sort of being sucked in. The size of this circle is going to be approximately the event horizon of the, telescope, of the black hole. And so from evidence like this, we know these supermassive black holes exist. So of course, most of this talk is going to be on how they form. But before we do that, you may be wondering, I've skipped from stellar mass to supermassive black holes. We've skipped a handful of orders of magnitude in the middle, so a brief aside on why I did that. It's because we don't actually know what's in the middle. So I talked about this 1 to 100, roughly, range of mass that we call stellar mass black holes, and then above 10,000 solar masses, roughly, that we call supermassive black holes. The Exactly where that boundary is isn't well defined. But there's this whole range of masses, roughly 100 to 10,000 solar masses in the middle, where we haven't been able to find any black holes in that regime. So there's a, co a couple possible explanations. We may just not be lucky yet. We haven't been able to see them. They're too faint. They're too small, you know, these supermassive black holes are really, really bright because they're so massive. If you make them a little less massive, it's harder to see when they're far away. It could also just be they don't exist. And this sort of gets into supermassive black hole formation, like I'll talk about in a little bit. But so these, this is the very uh, elusive intermediate mass black hole, which if, if someone finds one, you'll probably hear about it. It's going to be a pretty cool result. But OK, so let's go back to the main part of this talk. So we now know that there are stellar mass black holes that we see within our galaxy, and they're formed when stars die. We know that we see supermassive black holes in a lot of galaxies. So how do the supermassive black holes form? And to understand why this is a big problem in astronomy, you need to know one thing about supermassive black holes, and that's that they're found in the earliest stages of the universe. So if you were to look at a snapshot of the universe, universe when it was 450 million years old, which may not sound very young to you, but if the universe was currently roughly 50 years old, it would be two years old at this point. This is roughly 3% of the lifetime of the universe. 
So if you were to go back then and look around, you would see black holes that are 10 million times the mass of our sun. So they had to grow from nothing to 10 million times the mass of our sun in the equivalent of roughly two years in a more human time scale. So this is as though a two-year-old were like 100 pounds. They'd have to eat a lot really, really fast. And so this is an image showing an example of this. This is from a recent really exciting result from the James Webb Space Telescope, which is a new telescope that launched and makes these amazing infrared images on like anything we can imagine. And so the background here is from James Webb. And the foreground is X-ray emission from Chandra. And if you were to zoom in on this tiny little point, you would see a bright X-ray source, extremely luminous, something only a black hole could do. But you'd see this tiny little smudge there. That's a galaxy. And that galaxy is in the 450 million years. So you directly detected this bright X-ray emission coming from this tiny little galaxy way back at the beginning of the universe that must be a black hole, a very, very massive black hole. And so this was direct evidence that these things can exist really early on. So that means we have to make these extremely big black holes in a really short time. So how do we do that? Let's consider some possible explanations. So first, we know that nearby black holes form that are roughly the mass of our sun. So let's just make one of them Pac-Man and have it eat a ton of stuff around it, okay? In fact, at the beginning of the universe, we think stars were a bit bigger, maybe 100 solar masses, so we can start there instead of one solar mass. We can start at, say, 100 solar masses and have it just start consuming everything around it, okay? If you just dump all the gas in the vicinity, all the stars, into the event horizon of this black hole. Could we then make it 10 million solar masses in only a short amount of time? And the answer is actually no. So there's a physical law, sort of, that prevents this. And so this is called the Eddington Limit. If you decide you want to Google it at some point, but I'll explain it in fairly basic terms, hopefully. So imagine that you've got this black hole eating a ton of material. You sort of saw this picture earlier of a stellar mass black hole eating a star and it formed this disk of material. So that material gets really hot. There's a lot of friction within it. That heat produces photons that push the material away. So you can imagine a photon hitting another particle of material. So one hot particle generates a photon that hits another particle and pushes it away. If you have enough photons, it sort of blows up the material. So if the black hole is eating really, really fast, it'll basically explode all the material away from it and stop having anything to eat. So this is called the Eddington limit. If the black hole is eating more than a certain amount, it destroys all the material around it. If you do the calculation, you find that to grow a black hole in 450 million years, you have to go above this limit. You have to go like 300 times this limit, which doesn't really work, at least for that long. It is possible, though, that you could do it in short bursts. Some people have managed to run simulations where they were able to make black holes consume a ton of material for a very short time. So if you had to go at, say, 3,000 times the editing limit for a very brief period and maybe do that a few more times, it might work. It's sort of hard to tell. We're still working on this. There's a few other problems with this. We haven't actually seen one of these 100 solar mass stars I mentioned. These are called population three stars, and the first stars that formed, and they're the ones who would die into small black holes that would feed to become the big black holes. If you have to start from a smaller star, it's a little bit harder to do this. You have to eat even more, so that's a little bit of a problem. You also have to have a ton of material around the black hole to consume. It's eating 10 million times the mass of the sun in material. It all has to be sitting nearby. And we don't know if environments like that actually exist. So let's consider some other options, since that one has a couple problems. So instead, let's take a bunch of stars, say 10 million stars, and put them really close together. Say you actually, maybe you have a few tiny little black holes in there too, and you combine them all together into one giant star, or you start adding black, feeding the black holes to make one giant black hole from a bunch of little black holes, so they all merge together, rather than directly eating the material, like turning it into gas, and then having it fall into the black hole, you just have them merge into one big one. Um, then you could form a black hole that's much, much bigger. So if you take, say, 10 million stars, shove them together to form one really big star and have it die into a big black hole, or take 10 million little black holes and shove them together and have them all merge into one big black hole. If you were to do this and people have tried to run simulations, you can make roughly a thousand solar mass black hole by just shoving a lot of little stars or little black holes together. And then if you take this and feed it some more, you don't have to feed it that much, it's already pretty big you can make a 10 million solar mass black hole. The problem with this 
is you have to start with a lot of stars that are very, very close together. So you have to somehow take millions of stars and shove them into a tiny little region and then force them to collide with each other. That is not easy to do. There's really not many places in the universe where you'd expect this to happen. There are these things called dense stellar clusters, which we know exist, that have a ton of stars right next to the core. So it's possible that that sort of environment could do this. And people are trying to look to see if they can see evidence for this sort of process happening, but we haven't found anything yet. So let's think about one more option, since both of these have been a little bit problematic, but maybe it could work. What if we just forgot starting with a star or starting with a tiny little black hole and just started with something big? Let's just take a gigantic cloud of gas, 10 million solar masses, say, of gas, and make it all just collapse directly into a black hole. That would be pretty easy. You don't have to worry about any of this other stuff. The one problem with this, there seems to be problems with everything, is you need to stop the gas from turning into a bunch of stars first. So what people have seen when you run simulations, and I'm going to show a little movie here, if you take a giant cloud of gas, where's my mouse? There we go. Okay, so this is a slight, this isn't a simulation of black holes trying to form, but this is just you've taken a cloud of gas and just focus on these little white spots. These are very dense regions of the gas. You saw you started with a spherical cloud and it's forming these dense filaments throughout the cloud instead of just staying as a cloud and then suddenly collapsing into a, a black hole. So the problem is the gas is cooling in various regions. It doesn't all uniformly stay hot and puffy, and it collapses into little star-forming regions, and you can see little stars forming and shooting out energetic blobs of material. This prevents any gigantic black hole from forming. You need to stop this process from happening, and there's a couple different ways you could do that. So one option is if you take a really, really bright light source, like imagine taking a gigantic flashlight, the biggest flashlight you can imagine, and shining it on this blob of gas. You can keep all this gas nice and hot, uh, prevent it from collapsing into these star-forming regions you're seeing in the white dots. Whether such a source existed at some point in the universe, it would have had to be when the universe was really young. It's possible, and people have found potential options, but we're not sure. You also would need the gas to have absolutely no of what we call metals, which is basically any element heavier than helium, because those allow gas to cool down and collapse into dense clumps more easily. It would need to be pure hydrogen and helium, and that is actually quite doable in the early universe, because a lot of these elements just hadn't formed yet. You had mostly hydrogen and helium. So it could work, and I think a lot of people really like this model right now, because as we find even more, I don't actually, oh yeah, that's the simulation name. <laughs> Um, I think a lot of people really like this model right now as we're finding more and more black holes that are extremely massive in the early universe. This can form a million solar mass black hole sort of instantaneously. You don't have to worry about mergers or feeding the black hole or anything like that. But okay. So we've gone through a few different models. Why don't we just go through them all one by one, summarize them, and think about the different predictions they make and how we might be able to distinguish between them. So first we have the Pac-Man model, where the black hole is eating a lot of material. So this could only happen when the universe was young. There aren't really conditions that we found in the sort of older universe that could do this. There's just not enough gas or anything near the black holes. We also would probably be able to see them, and we haven't yet. So this could only happen when the universe was really, really young. And it predicts that we might be able to detect at some point these growing black holes. You know, if you're growing a really tiny black hole into something really big, that would produce a lot of light. And hopefully we'd be able to see it. And in fact, you might be able to detect these black holes while they're still in this intermediate mass stage that I mentioned earlier. So within this model, these intermediate mass black holes would exist and you should be able to detect them eventually. In our second model, where we're taking a bunch of little stars or little black holes and slamming them together and trying to merge them into one big black hole, it could happen any time when you have that sort of environment, and this could exist in the more recent universe, so it's possible we'd be able to detect it um, somewhere relatively nearby. Also, if you have black holes merging, the little black holes, that creates gravitational distortions in space-time, um, which you may have heard about some of this in the news, detecting merging black holes using like the LIGO um, detector, and I'll talk a little bit about this more, um, but these, the black hole merger creates these waves in space-time that you can detect from Earth. Right now, we haven't seen any evidence for something like this, but maybe in the future with more sensitive instruments, we could do it. You would also expect with this model a lot of stars to be near the black hole. 
you had to form this black hole in the environment with a ton of stars, but not all of them necessarily need to have merged. Some of them will be left behind and just be around the black hole. So you might expect to see somewhere nearby a giant cloud of stars with a black hole in the center. And people are looking for this, and there was actually a result fairly recently where they think they might have seen an example like this. So that's sort of promising. And again, we could see intermediate mass black holes. This is predicted to just create first, say, thousand solar mass black holes that then grow. Um, and these thousand solar mass would be examples of intermediate mass black holes that we would hopefully be able to detect one day. And then we have our final model where we have this giant cloud of gas that collapses. So this, again, could only happen when the universe was a baby. I mentioned we need this very metal-free, just hydrogen and helium gas to prevent it from turning into stars. And we need some very bright light source to also prevent it from turning into stars. So this could only happen when the universe was very young. But in this case, no intermediate mass black holes need to exist. These gas clouds would just form the really big black holes immediately. You don't necessarily need smaller black holes to be present. So if we could measure, say, the mass of every black hole in the universe, the distribution of masses would tell us something about which of these models is true. And so we're working on this. We're working on this in a lot of other aspects of this problem. So one example is the James Webb Space Telescope, which I already sort of mentioned. Uh, this is a little depiction of it. So again, this is an infrared telescope that was launched recently. And one of the main science motivations, at least from my perspective, uh, was to find intermediate mass black holes, to find the tinier versions of these black holes and try to measure how many of them there are. Does it tell us which of these models is correct? Um, and I think there's a lot of already really promising results coming out. And this telescope was just launched very recently. So hopefully there'll be a lot more exciting stuff soon. Another instrument which is planned for the future, I think sometime in the next few decades, uh, hopefully. I don't remember exactly what the timeline is. But this is the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. And so basically the plan is to launch a bunch of lasers into space and have them form this triangle. And then you can detect slight deviations in space across the paths of these lasers. And that tells you about these distortions in space time that merging black holes can detect. And this will ultimately be sensitive to merging black holes that are relatively small, this intermediate mass. If you see two of them merging, this instrument would be able to see it, or sometimes some of the smaller black holes. And so hopefully this could help constrain the number of these black holes, um, how frequently they're merging. And also it's just a really insane concept to launch a bunch of lasers in space. So yeah, I think there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of mysteries left, um, but there's a lot of great people actively working on this. So hopefully we'll have an answer for you all soon. Thank you for watching and happy to take any questions. <laughs>
Yeah, so this question was, uh, I was saying that if you have this giant gas cloud and you shine a bright enough light on it, it'll stop it from forming stars. And so the basic idea is to form stars, you need the gas to sort of collapse into very dense regions. As long as it's big and puffy and hot, you, you won't be able to have dense enough patches to form stars. Stars are really compact objects relative to your typical gas cloud in the universe. Of course, gas naturally it will cool down. Um, there are various processes, uh, lots of chemistry stuff and that kind of thing <laughs> that will allow it to cool down. So if you want to stop that, you want to shine a bright source at it to keep it hot. Um, and it actually doesn't take too much. I think you can do it with some, if you have like a bright star forming galaxy. I think I've read some papers where you can just have a galaxy nearby that as long as it's emitting enough ultraviolet light, it can heat up this gas cloud enough. But it's still an open question exactly how you might do that. <laughs> okay, yeah, so this was a great question. Do black holes serve a purpose in the maintenance of the universe? And so yeah, black holes, especially the supermassive black holes, I probably actually should have talked about this, are really fundamental to galaxies. So they can release a huge amount of energy. They can spew these relativistic jets of materials. So imagine like a ton of really, really fast moving particles shooting out and slamming into the furthest reaches of the galaxy. This can trigger stars to form as it slams into gas. It can stop stars from forming in other places. It can sort of just blow apart galaxies. So they really profoundly affect their environments. And in fact, one of the ways we study black holes is through their connections to their host galaxies. So every, most galaxies have a supermassive black hole in the center, and if you try to measure, say, its mass, you'll find that the mass is very closely tied to that of the host galaxy. The st structure of the host galaxy, the star formation in the host galaxy, is all very closely tied to the properties of the black hole. And so you really can't understand one without the other. Even our galaxy would probably look completely different if it didn't have a black hole. Okay. Let's thank our amazing